Hey, Battle Creek Online, I'm so glad that you're attending with us today. My name is Josiah Guajardo, and I get to serve as one of our pastors here on staff, and we are in full throttle into the fall season. If you're like me, I gave in, I'm into the pumpkin spice stuff, or maybe you're getting ready for the NBA season that starts this week, or if you're like me, you're excited because hockey is back, and if you're an Avs fan, let's go Avs, but uh, we're just pumped that you're here with us today. We believe that you're not here on accident, and as always, We'll be worshiping with our five campuses in the Tulsa metro area, with our friends in the Middle East and in Egypt, going after one goal, one mission, to help you advance in your journey with Christ. And so that's what we're going to do today. Before we jump into the message, let me share a little bit more about what's happening here at Battle Creek Church. A couple weeks ago, we got to launch our brand new Battle Creek app. And if you haven't downloaded it, I want to encourage you to go ahead and download it. It's been an incredible tool. Let me just tell you, in my personal life, I've been able to wake up every single day, open that up, be able to pray, to read God's word, and to reflect on what God is doing, not only in my life, but in my family's life. And so I want to encourage you. It's been impactful to me, and I believe it can be impactful to you. Three weeks ago, we started our Stay Dusty Challenge. And so those who participated and did it, we want to say congrats and thank you for doing with that. But I just want to share some incredible things that have been going on. But I want you to hear from somebody who this was so impactful to. My friend Kim says, this challenge has been so great. I'm so thankful for this app. I get up each morning and eager to connect and to dive in to our daily scripture to really get up every single moment, eager to dive into God's word. That's a passion that I have, that I have for me and I have for you. And I'm so thankful because of your generosity, we're able to do that. Because you said yes, we were able to make Battle Creek Church app a possibility. And my wife and I, Delmi and I, have been serving and been coming to Battle Creek Church for over eight years. And we've been able to see the fruit of what God has been doing through our church, through all of our campuses, and through you, and what God has been able to do through you. And so I want to encourage you, if you haven't been able to participate in that, that you would take a step today, a leap of faith, and to give for the very first time. We're in the middle of our series called Creed, and what an incredible first couple of weeks it's been. We've been talking about unifying us as a body of believers. There's a lot of things that is causing division in our nation and in the world right now, and we believe that there is only one answer, and that is Jesus Christ. And so would you do me a favor? Would you grab your Bible, maybe a cup of coffee, would you grab a pen and a piece of paper, and would you really allow God to speak to you today. I would love to pray for you, and then we'll jump into our message today. Father, we're so thankful for what you're doing in our hearts and the life of our church, God. I'm thankful that we have the opportunity to come and to hear your word. God, my prayer is today that you would speak to us and that you would help us to advance in our journey with you, God, and we thank you in advance for what you're going to do. So speak to us today as we hear your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. It is so good to be with you today. I want to encourage you, uh, both here in our rooms and online, would you open the Battle Creek app and follow along with us in the sermon notes uh, today. In fact, in each of those passages, you, you, uh, there's a feature where you can share what God is speaking to you or what stands out to you uh, with our whole congregation. But if you would open that up and follow along with us today, let's pray together before we get started. Would you just kind of just put your hands in your lap and, and just say, Lord, I, I need you today. Would you speak to me? As we study this and the passages about your son Jesus and what he did for us by uh, being crucified, dying, and buried, Father, we pray today that those truths, those bedrock truths would come alive in our lives, that we would feel them again, we would experience them again, and and we would actually uh, know you in a greater way uh, when we say goodbye in a few minutes. In Jesus' name we pray, and together we all say 
amen and amen. See, there there are times, guys, when, when my wife uh, gets this look in her eyes, and I'm not, no, I'm not talking about that look. I'm talking about she's walking around the house. She stops. She looks at a wall. It is studying that wall, and, and I know what's coming. She, the, the question is going to be, do you think that we could take this wall out? In fact, guys, let me just help you today and give you a phrase that will save you all kinds of time and all kinds of money and a ton of headaches. This is the phrase, load-bearing wall. You just say, honey, I'm sorry, that's a load-bearing wall. We can't take that out. What that means is it cannot be removed. If it is removed, the whole house will fall down. And when we look at the Apostles' Creed, that's really what the creed is. It's, it's, it's the load-bearing wall of Christianity, but it's not incantational. Saying it doesn't give you some kind of power. If you say it a certain number of times, like Beetlejuice or click your heels together, you're not magically filled uh, with the Holy Spirit. This creed is a consolidation of all things Christianity, right? We put it all in a cauldron, turn up the fire, let it boil, and burn away the dross, and what is left is the core of our faith. And we call it the Apostles' Creed, not because the apostles wrote it, but they taught it. So let's look at this next part uh, of this creed uh, together, if we could. Uh, I believe in Jesus Christ, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. We're sort of taking this creed in chunks. And and last week, we we looked at the first big chunk of who Jesus is. Uh, Next week, we're going to look at another chunk. In fact, next week is the load-bearing wall of all all of Christianity. You don't want to miss next week. Next week, uh, October 27th, is also a Gospel Sunday. I hope you're praying about who you're going to bring with you next Sunday. Invite your kids' friends to spend the night, teenagers, elementary school kids, Bust them all into the church. Invite your friends, your neighbors. Be praying about that. But but today, we're going to cover this middle chunk about Jesus that he suffered under Pontius Pilate. And when you read that and you hear that, you, you might ask why. Why is it important to even mention Pilate? In the creed, by the way, there are only three people uh, mentioned. Jesus, of course, right? The Virgin Mary, who we dealt with last week. And, and then Pilate, this Roman official who's not even a Christian. The, the apostles could have mentioned anyone they wanted. They could have mentioned themselves. They could have mentioned uh, James and Jude, Jesus' brothers. They, they, they could have mentioned Old Testament saints like Moses or David, but instead they focus in on this guy named Pontius Pilate. And, and, and for some reason, he was important to this whole story. We've been reading in the one-year Bible in our app. Uh, I hope you have. And and, uh, one of the things we've seen this last week is that Jesus taught in parables. He did this all the time. Parables were made-up stories, right, to make a biblical uh, point. But in a parable, there are no real places or people or proper names uh, who were mentioned. That's what make-believe does, right, in a galaxy far, far away, and then a bunch of fiction, right? But, but the Apostles' Creed is different. The, the mention of this guy actually anchors this story and this theology to a specific point in history. The people of that day, they knew who Pontius Pilate was. So, so they said, look this up, guys. You, you know this happened. You, you know this leader who was responsible for this. this. This didn't happen on the backside of a desert somewhere. It happened out in the open. It happened in public. But, but more important than the why of the mention of Pilate is the why Jesus had to suffer. The, the writers attached these three things uh, to the suffering that Jesus I- endured, that he was crucified, that he died, and, and that he was buried. Th- these are load-bearing walls in Christianity. But before I get into that, I thought it would be important to read about Pilate, and, and we don't normally do this. We, we normally pick a shorter passage uh, of Scripture, and we go through it line by line, verse by verse, word by word, 
But, but to get an idea of who Pilate is, I want to read his story in, in the Gospels. By the way, he's mentioned in all four Gospels. But I want to focus in on John's account uh, of Pilate today. So, so look at your sermon notes in the app, and, and let's read uh, these scriptures uh, together. Uh, John 18, beginning in verse uh, 28. It says, Jesus' trial before Caiaphas ended in the early hours of the morning. Then he was taken to the headquarters of the Roman uh, governor. His accusers didn't go inside because it would defile them, so they wouldn't be allowed to celebrate uh, the Passover. Again, the Jewish culture laid all over this uh, story. We've been talking about it all year long. Uh, Verse 29, so Pilate, the governor, went out to them and asked, What is your charge against this uh, man? Verse 30 says, we wouldn't have handed him over to you if he weren't a criminal. Then in verse 31, "Then, then take him away and judge him by your own law, Pilate told them. Only the Romans are permitted to execute someone, the Jewish leaders uh, replied. Verse 32 uh, is a parenthesis. It says, this fulfilled the prediction Jesus' prediction uh, about the way he would die. Now, let's just stop here uh, for a second. Who who was Pontius Pilate? He he was the Roman governor of Judea. At at that time, the Romans were in charge, but but they gave the Jewish people some control and and some uh, say. And and a guy named Herod was the Jewish ruler. This Herod, Herod Antipas, was the son of of Herod the Great. And that Herod, Herod the Great, was the ruler at the time of Jesus' birth. But the Herod at the time of Jesus' death is the son of Herod the Great. And he really had no real power, or at least limited uh, power. But this guy Pilate, as the Roman representative, did have power. And if the Jewish leaders wanted to kill Jesus, They weren't permitted to do it. They couldn't do it. They had to bring Pilate in to do the job. That's the historical reason that Pilate is so significant. He's mentioned in the creed because only he could have Jesus crucified. Only at his command could Jesus be killed. Only by his word could Jesus even be uh, buried. So, So those three things had to be done in accordance with Pilate because only a Roman could do those uh, things. The the Jewish leaders did not have permission uh, to crucify uh, anyone. They they couldn't order the death of another man. And because it was the Passover, they couldn't even bury Jesus or they would be ceremonially unclean. So they had to have a Roman step in uh, for them. But, But above all that is Jesus who said, You don't take my life. I lay it down. I am the one who decides, not you. So so God moved historically through history, right, to to place Pilate right here so so that his word through the prophets would be uh, fulfilled. Now, let's keep reading uh, in in the text, if we can. Pick up in in verse 33 where we left off. Then then Pilate went back into his headquarters and called for Jesus uh, to be brought uh, to him. Are you the king of the Jews, he asked him. Jesus replied, is this your own question, or or did others tell uh, you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate retorted. Your own people. And their leading priest brought you to me for trial. Why? What have you done? Verse 36, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. Uh, Pilate said, so you are a king. Jesus replied, you say I'm a king. Actually, I was born and came into this world to testify to the truth. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. What is truth? Pilate asked. Then he went out again to the people and he told them, he is not guilty of any crime. But you have a custom of asking me to release one prisoner each year at the Passover. Would you like for me to release this king of the uh, Jews to you? But they shouted back, no, not this man. We we want Barabbas. Barabbas was a revolutionary. 
Now, chapter 19, verse 1, uh, then Pilate had Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip. The soldiers also wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. Uh, They put a purple robe on him. Hail, hail, the king of the Jews. They mocked him as they slapped him across the face. Pilate went outside again uh, and said to the people, I'm going to bring him out to you now, but understand clearly, I find him not guilty. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns, the purple robe, and Pilate said, look, here is uh, the man. Verse 6, when when they saw him, the leading priests and the temple guards began shouting, crucify him, crucify him, Uh, take him yourselves and crucify him, Pilate said, I find him not guilty. The Jewish leaders replied, by our law, he ought to die because he called himself the son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more uh, frightened than ever. He took Jesus back into the headquarters again and asked him, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Why don't you talk to me, Pilate demanded. Don't you realize that I have the power to release you or, or the power to crucify you? Th- then Jesus uh, said, you would have no power over me at all uh, unless it were given to you from above. So the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Pilate tried to release him, but the Jewish leaders shouted, if you release this man, you are no friend uh, of Caesar's. By the way, in in the Roman government, uh, the the prefect or the governor of outlying areas reported directly to uh, Caesar, uh, not to the Senate. And, And look at what he says. Anyone who declares himself a king is a rebel against Caesar. When they said this, Pilate brought Jesus out to them again. Then Pilate sat down on the judgment seat on the platform that is called the stone pavement. In Hebrew, Gabbatha, uh, or or the praetorium. It it was about noon uh, on the day of the preparation for the Passover. And Pilate said to the people, look, here is your king. Away with him, they yelled. Away with him. Crucify him. What? What? Crucify your king, Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the leading priest shouted back. Then Pilate turned Jesus over them, over to them to be uh, crucified. Now look, there's a lot in here. and We're going to unpack a few of those verses. But to recap quickly, Pilate was the Roman uh, ruler of Judea. And the Jewish leaders came to him to have Jesus punished. Uh, We want him crucified. We want him to die, and we want him to be uh, buried. And they needed Pilate to do that for uh, them. That's the historical purpose of, of this part of the creed. But there's a spiritual application, church. There's a spiritual application to this part of the creed, too, because the obvious question is, why? Why did Jesus need to be crucified? Why did Jesus need to be killed? Why why did Jesus need to uh, be buried? Now, let's go over these uh, one at a time. Uh, First of all, uh, let's talk about crucified. Why, Why did Jesus need to be crucified? Now, here's the short answer. For you, for me. The, the, the longer answer is that he was crucified to take your curse and to give you healing. Look, look at Galatians uh, 3. Christ has rescued us. Circle that word rescued. He has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse of our wrongdoing. For it is written in the scriptures, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Jesus, uh, by being crucified on a cross, took the curse off of you. Uh, under the law, there, there is a curse over all of us because we, we can't live up to its standards. We, we only have the penalty uh, of the law. So from the moment you were born, from the first time you sinned, you're, you're guilty. And because you're guilty, you're cursed and, and you are condemned. But Romans 8 says that we know we are free from condemnation. How? Through Jesus. He, he took the condemnation. Uh, by the way, uh, th- this word rescued here in, in Galatians 3, in, in the Greek, uh, it's in the aorist tense. I've told you before, that means it's a past completed action. It was done once 
and for all. He took the cursed, uh, and, and he replaced it with a blessing. That, that's what it means. But, but for Jesus, he was not just killed on the cross. There, there was a previous stage to it for him, uh, the, the torture. You see, death on a cross is really suffocation. You, you, you would be strung up on, on either ropes or, or nails or, or both, and, and you would hang down, cutting off your air supply. And, and so you would have to pull yourself up to, to get oxygen into your lungs. But, but after a while, you were too tired, and you would suffocate. Jesus, by the way, listen, he, he grew up his whole childhood and his whole life, really, under the shadow of the cross. You remember when Jesus was a baby, his family fled to Egypt because King Herod was trying to kill all the baby boys, right? But when Herod died, Joseph was told to come back home. But what he didn't know is that Herod's son was now in charge, and he was 10 times worse than his dad. And as Jesus and Mary and Joseph re-entered the promised land from Egypt, they had to travel past, history says, past 3,000 crosses of Jews who had been crucified by this Herod, by the son of the king, who had promised to kill him. So, so he knew of the cross his whole life. They didn't cook this thing up for Jesus. But Jesus' crucifixion was a little different. There was torture involved. Roman torture uh, was unique. Uh, the condemned person would be whipped with a cat of nine tails, a flagellum, right, that, that had nine strips of leather on it. Fixed at the end of each of these strips was broken glass and, and, and jagged rocks. And that glass and that rock would would tear the skin off of your skeleton. The back of the criminal would be emaciated like ground beef. There would be sweat and and blood loss. But that was in place of of being crucified. But for Jesus, he suffered that and the crucifixion. So why did he have to endure all of that? Well, in in the Bible, uh, we're, we're told, look at what it says in 1 Peter. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right by his wounds. Circle that word uh, in your Bible. By his wounds, you are healed. That, that word is a, a, a welt, a, a bruise, a, a bleeding sore, something that continually caused discomfort. And, and by Jesus' wounds, we are healed from our wounds. Jesus was crucified to remove our curse, and he was wounded to give us healing. Now, now what about uh, th- this next part, uh, the, the, the died part? Why, why did Jesus need to die? Look, Jesus' death was the sacrifice demanded for our sin. He was the spotless lamb that took away the sins of the world. But, but more than that, his death meant something. Romans 5, 8 says that God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die. Say die, church. To to die for us while we were still sinners. In, In dying, Jesus loved us. There's no greater picture of God's love than Jesus' death. Now, what about the next uh, part, this buried part. What, why, why was that important? Well, Jesus had to be buried in order to be resurrected. And, and in fact, uh, Colossians 1 uh, calls Jesus the firstborn uh, of the dead, meaning that his resurrection paved the way for our resurrection. One day, uh, church, we're, we're going to take off our old natural body and put on a new uh, natural body. But even before that, we're given the right to walk in resurrection power. This is really uh, the heart of the gospel. The, the, these three things combine together to sort of be the, the motor of our faith, the, the inner workings of redemption and, and salvation. As a kid, I, I was always the one who had to take everything apart. I just had to know how it worked. And, and in fact, my mom said at an early age, he's on the spectrum somewhere, right? And, and, and these three things that we've been talking about today show you not only the why, but how that this whole thing works, that, that, that they all involve real historical facts about Jesus. Listen, uh, they start with this historical figure, Pontius Pilate. 
So for a second, I want you to put yourself in, in Pilate's shoes. You're enjoying your evening, relaxing at home with, with your family when the Jewish leaders come knocking on the door. And, and I imagine he had to deal with them often. They were always pushing uh, the boundaries. And, and, and now they've got this guy, Jesus, with them. And they want him, Pilate, to do something uh, about it. And if you were Pilate, what, what would you do? But before you answer that, let's go back into the story and, and let's read. Let's look at his actual response uh, to and about Jesus. What did he do? How, how did he react? What was his state of mind uh, at the time? I, I've written some of these things down, and I'd encourage you to look at them in the app. First of all, I think Pilate was curious. In, in John 18, 29, he says, what is your charge against this man. He he was open to hearing about it. He could have just dismissed them, told them to leave, but he was curious, right? So curious, in fact, that he invited Jesus in. He sat down with him, started asking him questions. He he wanted to get his head around this whole idea of of who this guy Jesus is, but but he wasn't really willing to go much further than that because uh, the the next thing uh, he does is he acts inconvenienced, He says, take him away and judge him by your own law, guys. He he didn't want to mess with it. He he wanted to go back to bed or back to his dinner or whatever he was doing that he was interrupted from. He he didn't want to give his time to this matter. If this is so important, guys, you you deal uh, with him. But they keep pressuring Pilate, so he entertains them. Pretty soon, uh, Pilate is confused. Pilate's a Roman. He, He is an official, right? His job is to know everything about his area, Judea. If Caesar had sent a representative from Rome to talk to him, he better have an answer about what's happening in his territory. So so the fact that this one man has stirred up all this trouble confuses him. They have this little back and forth, right? Pilate and and Jesus, are you a king? No, I'm not. Yes, I am. Are you a king? Aren't you a king? It's kind of Yoda talk happening there. But, But in chapter 18 and verse 37, Pilate says, so you are a king. Jesus responded, you say I'm a king. Actually, I was born to come into the world to testify to the truth. And all who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. And and Pilate asked him, what is the truth? What is truth? He's so frustrated, so flustered that he finally admits that he doesn't really care about the truth. He he, he doesn't want to own the truth because he knows that if he does, that, that he'll have to make a decision. Is this starting to sound familiar? Uh, You ever had a conversation with someone you're trying to share Jesus with and and it kind of play out this way? One one last thing about Pilate is that he was scared. He he tells the Jewish leaders uh, that Jesus is innocent. He tells the crowd that Jesus is innocent. He practically begs them to let Jesus go. But, But instead they shout louder, crucify him. And in John 19, 8, uh, when Pilate heard this, it says he was more frightened than ever. He was scared. He was afraid. He wasn't sure what would happen. He didn't want to rock this boat. He might have even been embarrassed, but, but really deep down, he was scared of what others thought. And here's the application of all of this today. You know someone who doesn't know Jesus. And that person at times is probably curious. that They're willing to hear you out. They want to discuss it. But maybe that's as far as they want to take it. Or maybe they're inconvenienced that... Uh, why, why do you have to ask me to church again? Why, why do we have to talk about Jesus uh, again? Can we just enjoy lunch? But, but there's something stirring on the inside of them because they never get inconvenienced talking about sports or fishing or TikTok or golf or, or Taylor Swift, right? It, it's only when Jesus comes up that they get mad. Or, or maybe they're at the stage of being confused. They're, they're unsure, and it embarrasses uh, them, or maybe even angers them, or maybe they're, they're scared. The, the truth is we all know someone who's a little like Pilate. They've been asked to do something about Jesus, and they're not sure what to do. They, they just need our help, and, and that's where you come in because you believe in this creed. 
You, you know why Jesus was crucified, why he died, and why he was buried. But because you understand how Pilate and this whole scene we've talked about today was the hinge point of history all the way up to today. You know the one who holds the key to their curiosity, who is the answer uh, to all of their confusion, who can get them past their inconvenience, who can overcome all of their fears. They just need you to introduce them to Jesus. Would you pray with me across all of our campuses today and, and just bow your heads and, and close your eyes, but open your hearts. And I just want to encourage you today to, to not think about the points of the sermon, but would you think about the persons? Who, who is it that God has placed in your life, that he's put in your path, that's come across your path? J- just spend a few seconds right now at every single campus. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you someone who, who, who is in your life that is curious about Jesus. Maybe someone who's confused about faith and about God, who, who is perhaps a bit inconvenienced by all of this or, or scared and afraid. But, but the bigger question is this. Who are you drawing, Holy Spirit? Would you ask him that? Who, who are you drawing? Who do you want me to talk to to engage with, to invite this next week uh, to church? Would you just spend a few minutes asking the Holy Spirit that question? And as he begins to answer that question, to bring a, a face to mind or a name to mind, would you just jot it down on something? Would you pray for that person and say, thank you, Lord, that you've put them on my heart. Would you give me the opportunity? Would you give me a a moment? Would you give me the strength and the courage to act, to make a call or a text or to reach out, to drive by and see them, to, to walk by their desk this week? Give me that opportunity. Holy Spirit, if you're drawing them and you want to use me in that equation, then give me favor as I invite them to come with me to church next week. And Father, today I pray over all of our church that you would uh, anoint them as they go out of this place in a moment to to share the salt and be the salt and be the light and to share the gospel with, with men and women and boys and girls to bring them back to this place next week that they may hear the gospel. And Father, we pray on every end of this equation that you would begin to work. Holy Spirit, go do your thing. Uh, draw people. We, we thank you that no one can come to you a, a, unless you, they're being drawn by you. So, so do that work and, and use us to share a word and uh, to give a handshake or a hug and invite uh, 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 to bring them with us next week. And Father, we pray next week that we would get to see with our own eyes, men and women and boys and girls, cross that faith line to give their lives to Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, and together we all say amen and amen. What an incredible message that was. I really hope that it spoke to you as much as it spoke to me. And again, if this is your very first time, I wanna ask you, would you do me a favor? Would you fill out this Connect card? I wanna know about what God is doing in your life and wanna hear your story. So would you go ahead and fill that battlecreekchurch.com forward slash online, or you can scan that QR code. Uh, Our pastors would love to reach out and to hear what God is doing in your life. As our senior pastor Alex always says, our primary calling is to go and make disciples. And we have an opportunity to do that next week with our Gospel Sunday. Our Gospel Sunday is when we invite new people who don't know Christ. The pastor shares the ABCs of the Gospel, that God sent His only Son for you and for me. And so I want to encourage you. Last week I asked you, who is God putting on your heart? Well, this week I want to challenge you. Would you text them? Would you invite them, maybe this link, or maybe to come attend with you so that they can hear the good news, which is
is Jesus Christ. If you're praying for somebody, we want to pray with you. You can do that through that connect card or in the chat. Just drop below the name that you're praying for. We want to partner in prayer with you, believing that God is going to have a personal meeting with them next week. So join us next week as we continue our series in the Creed. And as always, we love you, we're praying for you, and we'll see you next week.